It's, it's Tabletop, tabletop time. time. I'm Jazza. I'm Dave. And this is the video for you. I've uh, taught a few people how to paint in my time running a game store. And uh, I'm going to basically take you through where a lot of people start uh, building their hobby on a budget for the first couple of steps. And we're going to start by showing you how to paint this. And then I'm sort of the the user scenario where I've explored a lot of GW products and done that vanilla Blood Angels army, but I have discovered there is so much more to mini painting. There's resin models and there's oil paints. And there's a... I'm gonna try and get you to the stage by the end of this video in my half so that you can start exploring everything from wet palettes to glazing and different techniques. We're gonna go from beginner steps to intermediate and beyond in this one video. I'm gonna show you how to paint this. <laughs> Be fun, but I think we need to start at the very first thing, which is the first experience buying a mini, buying a, a paint set. What's that go like? Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the shop. Hey. Oh, oh man, the, oh, there's a lot of stuff here. Oh, where do I start? Don't touch anything. Oh man, store and it looks so cool. He probably just thinks I look like an idiot. Look at all these models, they're so cool. How am I supposed to paint like that? Oh, he must have spent thousands of hours on these. I can't even dream of oh, doing that kind of thing. Whoa, oh, whoa, look at all those paints. Contrast, effects, dry? Hey, is there a particular paint you're looking for? Mm, nah, just looking. Why bother looking at paint? You won't be able to use it. $230 just for a starter box? How am I supposed? Oh, what's this? A starter set for $60? They look cool, but maybe this is like the dumb box. Like maybe I'll look so stupid or dumb if I get this. I mean, I can afford $60. Hey, you interested in Space Marines? Yeah, they look really cool. Yeah, awesome, man. Did you have a color scheme in mind, or...? Um, well, this one comes with the paints, which I think is cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That gets you kind of what you need to get started painting Ultramarines, who are like the poster boys of Warhammer. So it's always a good place to start. Yeah. Did, did you paint all of those in, models? In the cabinet? Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Uh, you'll notice most of them are like the bad guys. I kind of love painting Chaos Space Marines, oh. but... um. Yeah, absolutely. I painted them. Um, oh, cool. Did you need any tips or...? Um, yeah, I've never painted before, so yeah. Why don't I show you how to paint them? All right. Uh, so this is, for most people, going to be about the first experience you get in the hobby. In front of us, uh, I've pulled out my uh, Assault Intercessors and paint set. Uh, which is fairly complete. It's got six paints, uh, one of which is a wash and one is a texture paint. And it also has a brush in it. And what you need to add to this, or what I've added to this, is a pair of clippers, uh, flat-sided clippers. Uh, I've also brought in an, a synthetic larger brush just for the speed of painting for that base coat. And finally, some spray primer. So I've tried to keep the tools and supplies as low to the ground as possible, as easy for entry for anyone getting into the hobby. Uh, and these are sort of some of the things I would recommend starting out with. Now, when we look at cutting out models from the sprue, always making sure to use the flat side of the blade against the model to minimize the little sprue tags that can be left out and sort of minimize that cleanup you have to do. Some really easy tools you can grab that can help you out uh, are actually often to do with nails. So a good pair of uh, lever action nail clippers, some files, these kinds of things you can find around the house or get at a, at a chemist very cheaply. So when we're putting together our model, these particular models are push fit, which means that as you cut them out, each of the components presses together, sometimes with a little bit of force required, 
uh, and it shouldn't require glue. Although usually we would recommend using glue as it helps it hold its form once it's finished. Uh, but again, for the purposes of this exercise, I chose not to use glue to minimize the amount of supplies uh, that I would need. After they're assembled, I took the models off to be spray painted. Uh, I used Chaos Black, which is Games Workshop's primer. Personally, for me, I find that the time saved and the quality of undercoat laid down by a spray primer just far outweighs any attempts used to uh, brush on hand primer. But that is a personal choice and there are plenty of people who would like to airbrush or hand paint on primer. Now, the reason we use primer on a model is that it can help Help lay down the later layers of paint. We're using very thin acrylic paints that can rub off due to oils on the skin quite easily and a primer really helps set an even texture and surface that um, is designed to help the future layers of paint stick to the model but it also gives you a solid single colored base uh, to work from and to build those colors up upon. Now you'll see that I actually made my own little paint pot handles using some blue tack and just sticking models to paint pots that I wouldn't be needing uh, at that stage of the process. I gave myself a handy little handle that I could then paint the model from without touching it and as mentioned getting those oily skin fingers marking and smudging up the paint I was just laying down. So the first step was base coating roughly with blue uh, where I grabbed the Macrag blue and I mixed a little bit of water with it on a palette which is always important to get a, a slightly thinned down texture. With limited tools available, I didn't have a palette on hand, so I just used the packaging. There's a nice white plastic packaging that came with the box that works perfectly as a paint palette. So I then applied that rough, rough coat of blue. Something I found in years of doing the hobby is uh, new painters are always really scared of putting the first bit of paint on the model, and I really encourage just just get paint everywhere because you paint every surface covered in the primer. It doesn't matter if you're painting black, you always hand paint black over primed black because the texture of the paint strokes comes out differently and unpainted primer always looks slightly odd. So every part of the model is going to be hand painted. So it doesn't matter if you get your blue or your first primary color all over the shop. It's more important to do this stage kind of quickly so it doesn't bore you to tears basically. Uh, so once we got the blue down, I moved on to the gold. The reason I did this is because this kit has one wash and a wash is a paint that we apply on top of these base coats to give it a bit of depth. But we'll get to that when we go to the wash. Because there is only one wash, we can paint all of the base colors down on the model before applying it, skipping a whole bunch of going back and forth between base coat wash, base coat wash, and basically just speeding up the whole process. So you can see here that while I'm handling the model and painting it, I'm actually rotating it quite a bit and trying to get a good angle. I find that rather than trying to sort of fight the model with the paintbrush, it's easier to mount the model on something that you can handle and turn easily so that you can come at it from the different angles and work with the shape of the paintbrush. You can't get a wood paintbrush to suddenly bend and go around a corner, but you can certainly move a one inch tall model in your hand. So I find that's usually the easier way to go. What I often recommend to customers who are looking at ga the Games Workshop brush range is generally to just grab a medium layer brush. For me, that is the sort of multi-purpose generalist brush that I will put through all kinds of riggers, but it also comes to a fine point. That brush alone sort of gets a lot of new painters through their first couple of months before they decide whether it's right for them and they're ready to move on to things like Kalinsky Sables and uh, the more expensive brush products. Now that we painted the blue and the gold, I painted the areas uh, that I were going to be left black on the model, such as the seams in the back of the armor, the weapons, uh, and the leather pouches around the waist. Given that I only really had four colors to work with, black was the logical choice for them. Following that, I did a quick cleanup. Uh, I find it's easier to paint uh, your cleanup at the end of doing all the base coats rather than going back and forth and a lot of people also I found have been really get really finicky and worried about making little mistakes but the thing is every time you paint and put paint on the model you're there's a chance you're going to make a little mistake so if you kind of get to the end of the step you're working on and then clean it all up you minimize the back and forth again which all of these things just help to make it a much smoother experience so you're not wasting time going back and forth and you don't kind of drive yourself around the bend. Afterwards we put that wash on the wash is basically the most amazing product. They're, they're called washes, shades, inks, the various things by various companies. But effectively, it's a very watered down paint pigment that you can apply uh, liberally, we'll say, over the whole model. Uh, you'll see that I effectively loaded up a brush very heavily and slathered it on. I just let it sink into every recess and every part of the surface of that model, uh, making sure it falls into the recesses and shades it. With these shades, don't be shy. You can really go ham at it. It's actually really 
satisfying because at the end of that step, you see all the depth in the model that might've been hidden by the base coats uh, pop out. All the recesses get filled with this darker tone and it settles there and dries there. And then suddenly we get all this depth in the model. Once that's done though, we have kind of dulled down the miniature. When I look at it, it just looks flat. So we generally will go to highlighting next and with a limited selection of paints, the best method I've found is to grab those base colors and just do a top down highlight on the whole model with the same base coat again. So what that means is pretend there's the light like the sun in the sky and then effectively just from that angle, paint the top side of everything as, I, as you go down. You'll see on various armor panels, I'm sort of painting just the top of the knee pad blue or just the top of the shin guard, just the top of the helmet. This leaves all that nice shaded blue down the bottom in a sort of natural gradient that's given you a whole range of uh, color from highlight down to depth with a really simple process. Now, if you wanted to take this to the next level, you could get a whole bunch of layer paints that are brighter shades and bring it to point highlights and edge highlights. And I'm sure most of you in your painting journey will get to that point. But for this uh, video, just working on what we've got in this box, uh, that wasn't really an option. So this is where we left the highlights for now. All right, so now I started working on the white. There's only a few uh, areas on these models that are white. We have the ultramarine symbol on one shoulder pad and their close support marking on the other shoulder pad. I also chose to paint the grenade in one of their hands white. Usually white doesn't scream to me as a color for a grenade, but I actually think it worked out well, mostly due to the fact that there's so few colors to work with. It just gave a little bit of contrast to the model and showed off that he was holding something in that hand. Once I'd painted the white though, I realized that I really could have done this at the start when I talked about basing it all and then putting the one wash down because it was just sitting too flat for me. So I actually went back and applied the Agrax Earthshade wash onto the white as well. Here I sat back, looked at my models and said, probably should do something else. Maybe it's the years of hobby screaming at me, but I just couldn't quite leave it there. That black was sitting there with no highlight and I was looking at those eyes that had absolutely nothing in them, these eye lenses, which traditionally I'd probably pick a red for an ultramarine, but we didn't have one. So I just went uh, I'm gonna do a simple mix, a really basic mix. So I just grabbed the black and the white, mixed them together to make a mid gray and just did an edge highlight along the weapons. Just those black areas, the leather pouches, the weapons, just to make it pop and give it a little bit of depth because it was looking very flat. A really cool trick with the edge highlight for new painters who often go, oh, it looks really sort of hard to do. It's such a narrow straight line. I didn't take too much time doing it on these models because they're a bit rough and ready, but you just use the side of the brush. So use the flat side of the brush with not too much paint on it and just glide along the edge of the model. Following there, I made a really small and quick blue and white mix, which I just dabbed into the eye lenses and then topped that off with a small dot of white just to make the lenses look like they were uh, sort of a light. And that was almost the end of the story for those models. I grabbed the Astro Granite texture paint that is in the packet, slapped it all over the bases. And once that was dry, I put an Agrax Earthshade wash onto that as well. And then to finish the model and give it that sort of game piece look, I trimmed the base in the Abaddon black again and put a final Agrax Earthshade wash all over that Astro Granite just to give it some depth. And there you have it. Uh, I hope you can see how with a really, really limited selection of paints and tools that are quite accessible for someone starting out to the hobby, you can actually achieve some pretty cool things. And I encourage everyone to give these sort of simple techniques a, a go with their new model uh, journeys and um, just have the confidence to dive in and, you know, give it a go. Yay, you did it. Congratulations. <laughs> Your first set of minis or mini, uh, single mini or just mini painting experience. Not as scary as I thought, was it? No, and hopefully that shows you all you need to know to get started with a basic kit uh, and just a few extra tools. And a bit of bravery. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share some of the things that I've discovered since re-entering the hobby. Things like the wet palette and resin minis and non-GW minis. Like they exist, they're a thing. <laughs> and take you through some of the things that I learned coming back into the hobby that I'm hoping will uh, take some of you to that next step and beyond. And uh, then we can go into the beyond.
together. One of the things I discovered that delighted and surprised me is that there are more minis in the world than Warhammer. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Games Workshop models. Honestly, they are easily in my top two or three uh, miniature producing companies and styles, but I've experienced and enjoyed so much more in minis and in tools, which was one of the motivations in my creating the Mega Minis box. Now, I'm just gonna give it a quick plug because there is one week left for their availability. So if you're watching this video a week after it came out you can go check it out now the mega minis box is part of the ultimate creativity collection and the minis box comes with everything you need to dive into minis not just at the, at the beginner level but beyond it includes everything i'm going to go through in this section of our little video guide and has some really cool stuff like milliput for customizing your models basing materials for texturing and doing sand and grains and snow effects a wet palette a sable kalinsky brush a full set of primaries and secondary colors some browns some gold and silver washes some great tools like sprue cutters and hobby knife and loads more but of course the most important thing is minis. The Jazzy Strikers which comes with more than enough miniatures to customize and make five custom minis. That's not to say that it has five of each body part it actually has a lot more than that but it has five core bodies that you can match some of the 11 heads to one of which is mine because I'm a narcissist like that. The Mega Minis box also comes with a custom display miniature which is something I had never heard about or painted before getting back into the hobby as an adult, miniatures at a larger scale and a much higher level of detail and drama and storytelling. It's really, really cool. And the display minis in my box are based on an artwork I made a few years ago, the Apocalypse Ghost Scene. And I really love these minis. And once again, these two sets of minis are completely exclusive to the Mega Minis box and won't be available after a week from now. So go check it out. Now these minis, you might notice, are a bit different to the GW minis that Dave painted. These are made from resin. So they do have places you need to clean up, but they're actually made and molded in a different way. Most of the GW models are actually plastic injection molded. These are resin casts. You'll see these connection points mainly to like the feet and some areas that are less detailed and less visible when you hold the model. These are like the uh, the pouring points. That's where the resin flows into. So you separate those and clean up with your hobby knife. And this is a step that's entirely optional, but because it's a magnet based system, you can of course glue in little magnets into all of those little holes so that all of the arms and limbs can connect and disconnect. Again, it's optional and I find it fun. I find it so fun, in fact, that I added a magnet to my head so I could move the position of my head and really pose it. This is not easy to do and not entirely recommended, but this is one of the things I find fun about the hobby, customizing, or as a lot of people call it, converting. So for example, I want to make a Jazza warrior, again, because I'm a narcissist, <laughs> who is wielding art supplies. And so I picked some different limbs that are holding weapons that I thought would make good art supplies if I chop them up and do a bit of sculpting. Now the Jazzy Striker set happens to have a magnetized pole arm thing that you can actually magnetize and attach different weapon heads to like a hammer or a sword. So I just used that pole arm head and sculpted a little brush out of Milliput on top. And the great thing about Milliput is it's water based. A lot of customization work that people do and that I do is using this stuff called green stuff. It's an epoxy putty. It's, it's uh, much trickier to work with. So for beginners I definitely recommend Milliput because you can smooth areas out with water. It doesn't take long to work, neither does it take long to cure. You can heat it up uh, to speed up the curing process. And when it's done, it feels pretty solid. It almost feels like a solidified plaster, but less brittle. And Milliput is great, not only for sculpting some little details, but it's also great for filling gaps. In fact, it's especially good for this. So whether you want to customize details or not, I definitely recommend having Milliput so you can just mix tiny bits and just fill some cracks and crevices or cover details you want to cover up. And then you can just blend and smooth that out with a bit of water on top. And with my custom Jazza warrior ready to go fully converted I give him a bit of a base primer now I'm using a brush on primer there are a few different forms of this and, and it's great alternative if you don't have an aerosol or an airbrush one thing to mention as well is if you get into non GW minis particularly kickstarted or independent minis that tend to be often more resin minis they can have a, a bit of a mold release chemical on the outside of those miniatures so it can be advised to give them a gentle wash or scrub in some warm water with a toothbrush just to make sure that there's no chemicals that will disincentivize the primer from sticking. But with my primer all applied and my magnets all in place, I have a miniature that is poseable and custom and epic. Now, I used to love converting my Games Workshop minis back when I was into the hobby as a teenager, and of course, I'm getting back into it as an adult. But one thing I never had discovered or used up until getting back into miniatures was this thing. 
It's called a wet palette and it is magnificent. Now you can make one yourself out of some Tupperware and a sponge and some baking paper, but I highly recommend using one that is specifically made for this purpose. They just fit and work really well. They often come with paper to use and the lid fits are often such that there's not too much air leak and you can lock away your paints with the, with the lid on without them absorbing too much water over time, but also keeping your paints moist over the course of several days, even over a week. One recommendation that I will give is that anyone who got the Jazzy Art Box and got this wet palette, the Stay Wet or Star Wet wet palette, I'm not sure how to pronounce it actually, but it's a great starter wet palette, except the paper it comes with is actually pretty abysmal because it's made for more like large scale acrylic paint, not miniature acrylic paint. So I definitely recommend just using baking paper or like the stuff you bake cookies on, cut that up and put that inside, it's way better. It has the perfect amount of uh, moisture retention. So as you can see, I do a couple of base coats with a very thinned down dark maroon uh, color. It looks quite watery. Don't worry about that. That's how you're gonna get a really smooth surface. So I go through all of the areas of the model and do a base coat and going in that second and sometimes even third time with that really thin down coat of a base color provides really solid coverage and a really smooth surface to work from without losing any detail. So I take time going through that same process that Dave described, just covering all of the areas that have color in the base coat. It's important to, to make sure to cover everything with the solid color before you move on to the shades, because like Dave saw with his grenade, if you change your mind later, you'll have to go in and add that shading later as well. So with the base coat down, I actually move on to a brighter coat and start laying that in all the panels, just starting to create some highlights. I don't do this to an extreme amount, but I just wanna start creating a little bit of contrast to work with and give myself a visual guide. And now moving on to the shades. These shade paints are fantastic. Just as Dave gushed about them, I have to gush about them too. Dave showed you one of the best ways to learn how to start painting your first minis if you're intimidated, and that's just to be fearless. But once you start building your confidence, it can be good practice to decide where to paint the shades because the shade color painted on a flat surface or a clean highlight that you've already painted can sort of muddy things up. And you can of course go back and clean it up later, but I tend to really enjoy crafting the miniature as I paint it and decide Deciding where that shadow goes and where to add a little bit more and build it up is a really fun process. So the next step for me is just adding more highlights, really trying to build up that contrast. So in the areas where I started to build up some of that brighter color, I just keep going until I reach the peak saturation and brightness of the areas that have most exposure to light in the color scheme and lighting scheme that I'm working on. Now you notice so far on the armor panels, it's been pretty straightforward because they're all fairly rigid flat panels at different angles. So deciding what's brighter and what's darker is pretty simple. Cloth can be a little intimidating for people, but actually I find it one of the most satisfying things to paint. And it's a very similar process. You're just working up towards the brighter layers. So start with your base coat and put in your shade if you're using a shade and just slowly work up layer by layer to the lightest color in your gradient. And remember that wet palette, you'll notice behind me, I have this red gradient and this blue gradient. I'd literally just mixed the transition of colors on the wet palette and I can just literally dip in different areas of that gradient and slowly move to my brighter color. It makes the shading process super easy and really simple to understand. It's really satisfying. Now we're getting to some of the details. We've done all the broad shading, we've done clean up as we've gone, and now we're gonna make it as sharp and sexy as we possibly can. And this is where some people panic a little bit, worrying about needing the steadiest hands in the world. You'll notice I actually rest my hand on my other hand and both of my hands or elbows are rested on the table. There are several anchor points, so you can create stability for yourself. Another way to make sure you're painting accurately is to make sure that your paint and the tip of the brush is as well set up for success as possible. What I mean by that 
is just like Dave described, if, if the brush or the paint in the brush isn't really ready for you, it's gonna cause some problems and it's really frustrating. Something I noticed coming back into the hobby is a lot of mini painters with paint all over their thumbs and thumbnails. I didn't understand what this was for, but when I actually started doing it, I completely understand and I highly recommend it. Basically, it's like a mini palette right next to the mini. So once you've got the right consistency of paint in the tip of the brush, if I'm starting to paint details, the first area I paint isn't the mini, it's actually my thumb. What this does is removes excess paint from the tip of your brush, so it doesn't cause any problems when you paint on a mini, and it also moves it towards the very end, the tip of the brush, so that you have the finest point and it's wet and ready to paint. Now, faces are one of the trickiest things to paint, I'll admit it, but just take your time and don't worry so much. If you make a mistake, it's easy to go in and fix it. 10 times if you need to. Just don't use thick paint so you lose the detail and just take a deep breath, steady yourself and try and enjoy the process. Maybe listen to some tabletop time uh, game sessions in the background. Get absorbed in something other than uh, the thing that you're doing in a way that will make you anxious or worry about it. You will get better over time. Yes, there are a lot of people better at it than we are. And if looking at me doing this and you're a beginner looks too confronting, don't worry. Like everyone has different stages and it's really important to just try and enjoy where you're at and be proud of your achievements. And I've got to say, in conclusion, that's my favourite thing about mini painting. The challenge of it is really fun, but the pace of it is really relaxing and enjoyable, but also the nature of painting something small that you constantly have very close to you as you work on the details, but keep pulling away and looking at the whole is really satisfying. It's really easy to be really proud of something you made. But I really hope that some of these tools and tips and tricks that I've shared help you take your mini painting to the next stage and give you a lot that you can work on and enjoy in your hobby. So there you have it. You have everything you need from the very beginning little baby baby steps to a few, few bigger, braver steps and beyond. This video is really intended to just show that it's approachable and uh, you can start really basic, but there's so far that you can go, so many things you can dive into and so many approaches you can have, whether it be airbrushing or some fancier stuff or budget ways of doing fancy things. I think we're gonna try and dive into all of it. Absolutely. And um, there's been a lot of people sort of reaching out and asking for a, a place to start. Where do I start with this? And uh, we really hope that this has provided what you need and you've yeah. got the confidence to get going in your miniature journey. Hopefully. We're, we're not going to do a lot of tutorials on this channel, uh, but really what we're going to be trying to do is experience the beyond ourselves. Try and try new things ourselves in our journey. And we just wanted to start off by making this video so that those of you who are joining us along with that journey have that sort of foundation, how it works. You can sort of practice in your own time or try it out when you have the time or space, but also uh, experience some new things with us as we try them for the first time. I think it's going to be a good time. Absolutely. So what should they do to hang out for that good time, Dave? What should, I wonder what, what do I do watching this video when I've learned so many cool things and met so many cool people and experienced such great production values and editing and comedic timing? I think you hit the subscribe button, don't you? Oh God, that's a relief to hear. Yeah, it's not that complicated. I think I'd have known that by now. Yeah, you get the mouse <laughs> and you drag the cursor and boom. That's a good idea. I think I might do that, <laughs> I would say, if I were you watching this video. And while I'm there, I'd probably hit the like button and that little bell notification <laughs> too. Hang around and uh, we'll see you next time.